Hi and good morning everybody. My name is Asfandiar Kuhi and I'm working with John Balsham as a simulation product uh, manager team. Today, uh, topic, we are going through creep analysis, how we can do it in SolidWorks simulation. And let's get started. Okay. The first thing we would like to mention is our objective, how this uh, presentation is being structured. We then first going to creep definition and stages of the creep, looking at the graphs. Then we introducing the creep testing machines and what is coming from creep testing in a real life. And then since we got the, uh, let's say, test result, we are introducing the mechanism of uh, the creep, means different formulation and how we can curve fit all the generated data to a series of functions. Uh, from there, we are specifically focusing on SOLIDWORK tree creep uh, equation, a power law equation. And then since we have understood how so uh, SOLIDWORK simulation is treating the creep problem, we will create two different case studies. Well, the test data is going to curve fit. One case study is going through temperature in the dependency case, and the other is independent of the temperature. All right, now let's get started with the creep definition, which is the tendency of the solid material to move slowly or deform permanently under influence of the mechanical stress. Therefore, this phenomenon is a time dependent. So you have two ways of doing a test. First, it's time dependent strain produced under a state of a constant strength still below the yield strengths, or you applying the constant strain and you're looking at the stress reduction since there is a permanent deformation on the structure. And over the time, it's reduced the stress since have a more and more deflection on the part. This phenomenon, as you can see in the picture, are more severe in a material which is subjected to the heat, uh, let's say, loadings. Uh, for a long period. Mostly we are talking about this importance coming to the picture if the, uh, let's say, the temperature you're applying is more than 30% of the melting point and it is uh, increases as they are just getting close to the melting point. Well, there are a couple of good examples and we uh, are facing in uh, our, maybe in our daily activities like a, a turbine design where it's subjected to a variation of the heat and mechanical force and also in a, uh, let's say, concrete structures, well, we have a constant loading such as people load and the facilities inside the building, and this is existing over the time, and it could cause some crack due to creep uh, in the structures. All right, now it's the time to look at the stages of the creep. If you look at, the, uh, look at this graph, which is expressing the strain as a function of time at the constant, uh, let's say, temperature and stress, you can see the first stage is the primary range. Well, we have the strain rate is relatively high, and you can see the slope is pretty big on the first stage, and then it slow downs as the material get a surface hardening. Then that makes a lot of sense. This is something that we are experiencing. So you're putting a stress on the material, it's getting stretched rapidly, and then it's a slowdown and it's coming to the second stage. We'll be talking about strain rate eventually reach minimum variation and become nearly constant here. This is what we can do. And if we keep continue on play application of stress on the structure, then we reaching uh, to the third stage. Well, again, strain rates are exponentially increases with the stress. And what is happening? We getting necking problem. So at some, uh, let's say, uh, section, the cross section is decreasing, and the material is simply reaching to the fracture. So what we understood first is increase the strain rate, then become constant, and then again, if we, uh, let's say, keep on uh, apply application of load, then we got the fracture. And this is exactly where you can see the crack and uh, maybe a broken part. 
In order to uh, perform any uh, creep testing, there are some specific uh, machines designed for that purpose. Well, basically we're talking about an spiceman. Well, you just simply uh, fix it to the grips and there would be hitting element which is uh, over, uh, around your spiceman and also there is a load application to the spiceman and then you have two major sensors. First, extension measuring over the gauge lens and also a thermocouple to record the temperature result. What you will generate is a creep time dependent curve by calculating steady rate of creep in reference to the time it takes for material to change. So what we have is an spiceman from the material you would like to make the design of. You need to put it on the creep machine testing, apply a load, apply a temperature, look at the, the variation of the len lens uh, uh, over the time and record the data. That is a must to do it's, and uh, it's look like the material property and input data to any FEA software. Okay, this equipment can uh, be used for creep testing. Also, there are so many other applications like displacement limited application for the size, uh, precise sizing and little errors or tendency to change on the structure and mostly common in uh, turbine rotor and jet uh, engines as the application. The other, uh, let's say, application we can mention is rupture limited application. Well, in this application, the break cannot occur to the, uh, to the material, but can be various dimension as the material goes through the creep. And the other one, as we mentioned before, is the stress relaxation limit application. Well, we have a constant strain and we simply measuring the stress over the time and see how the stress decrease as a result of permanent deformation on the structure. The very good examples uh, could be cables and wires and bolts. You can imagine uh, a cable under the tension and over the time it's getting stretched and the stress points are simply reducing. So from this slide what we can calculate, can, let's say conclude, is that we are doing a creep testing and make sure the basis of the calculation which is the material data and material properties of the creep is obtained. So you either can test yourself for your specific material or refer to any, uh, let's say, published lit literature or handbooks or material databases to get this testing done. It is not quite popular as the, uh, let's say, other material uh, properties such as uh, Young modulus and uh, Poisson ratios. In so many cases, it requires uh, 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 an external testing, uh, let's say, equipment to be uh, implemented. Now, since we got the, uh, let's say, creep or strain versus time, now it's the time to, uh, let's say, curve it and present this cloud point of data as a function. That is what we call it creep equation description. Well, time-dependent, uh, let's say, strain graphs are fitting into power equation normally. What, why we do that? We would like to define an expression for uniaxial creep strain in terms of uniaxial stress. Well, you can see strain here expressed by stress, time, and also temperature. Well, as you can see in a general formula, we have creep strain as epsilon. C is a constant depend on the material and particular creep mechanism. And also M and B, well, you can see it here. We are talking about exponent, again, dependent on the creep mechanism. Q is the activation energy of the, uh, let's say, creep mechanism. Sigma is applied stress, D is the grain size uh, of the material, so different material have different, uh, let's say, uh, molecular structure and with a different grain size, which is very important not just to level of strain at the end and on level of creep, but also about the mechanism of the creep, and on the next slide, this is what I'm going to introduce. 
k is a constant, which is called Bolts, uh, Boltzmann constant, and t is a temperature uh, mostly expressed in Kelvin. All right, so this is the general equation. However, depend on different level of stress, different grain size, different material, this equation can be modified. If we're looking at the first set, we are talking about dislocation creep. If I play this video, you can see dislocation creep are mostly happening at a high stress, means relative to its shear stress, and it is controlled by movement of dislocations. Means when you have uh, any imperfections in your molecular stru structures, the level of high shear, uh, high stress uh, is going to be dislocated and also concentrated in uh, any place when we have no perfect molecular structure and it can be glide or alter from top to the beginning. Well, as if you look at the summary, you can see if we are fi finding any vac uh, vacancies diffused into this location core, then we have the opportunity to climb these, uh, let's say, dislocations into a new location. That simply means we are doing an alteration to the molecular structure and the, let's say the place of creep and uh, are, is going to alter. Well, as you can see, the equation is also getting modified to a new, uh, let's say, a new equation with the different constants and it is not a focus of uh, today's pro presentation. However, if you need more information, we are happy to provide for you. The other, uh, let's say, model of creep are the diffusion creep models. Well, it's mostly referred to the formation of crystalline solids by the diffusion of vacancies through their crystal, uh, crystal lattice. The first model is nabarro herring creep, which is a form of diffusion creep, and it is less dependency on the stress and is highly dependent on the grain size. If you look at the video right now I'm, uh, let's say, showing to you, this is going to, uh, let's say, uh, do the variation on the shape of the grain, and the rate of the creep is highly dependent on the grain size, which is the reverse of it. Means more bigger grain reduce the creep. As a summary, if you like to look at the picture, in number of hearing and any material which is obeying this law, the actual grain is going to, let's say, uh, stretch or, uh, let's say, deform, and that's how the creep is simply getting created. The second mechanism is called cobalt creep which is occurs through the diffusion of atom, atoms in material along their green grain boundaries. Well, you can perfectly look at the grain network and we have the elongation through these boundaries rather than deforming the whole, uh, the, the one specific, uh, let's say, uh, grain here. What we have, cobalt creep has a low activation energy, so it's happening and can formulate the low uh, activation energy creeps, so it dominates at the low stress and temperature. Creep rate is reduced by increasing the great size, grain size as a structure with larger grains have fewer grain boundaries. So there are two different treatments, grain size to deform the whole grain or grain size to resist or having less boundaries against the, uh, let's say, uh, um, strain um, factors. All right, now with that introduction and understanding we have different treatments, let's look at SOLIDWORKS simulation in CRIP. The power law we have, uh, let's say, introduced uh, on the first slide uh, is going to be modified to Bailey-Norton law in SOLIDWORKS simulation. We would like to again have a definition and a relation between uniaxial creep and uniaxial stress expressed with time and temperature. 
Well, looking at this equation, you obviously can see epsilon is creep strain, C0, C1, and C2, as you can see in the equation, are talking about material-dependent constant. Well, mostly C1 is uh, more than 1, and C2 is somewhere between 0 and 1. Ct is the material constant defining the creep temperature dependency. So if it's 0, we have no dependency on the temperature. And if it's 1, it's fully dependent on the temperature. T is absolute temperature in Kelvin, and T is time in hour. So this is the formulation we're using in SOLIDWORKS simulation. And all our calculations are simply using that formulation. What is important to remember, first of all, classical creep law used in SOLIDWORKS, uh, let's say, simulation, just represent primary and secondary stage creep uh, stages only. So we are not going to represent anything as a fracture. Okay? Uh, second, the uniaxial creep law remains valid if the uniaxial creep strain and stresses are replaced by effective and uh, effective stress and strains. And also, we need to have strains incompressible. Okay, so if we have incompressible material or creep strain are incompressible, incompressible, then it is a valid calculation. Some material don't, uh, do not obey this, uh, let's say, sort of behavior. And one very other important thing is that the material needs to be isotropic, means the response of the material, if you applying stress on direction X, is exactly equal to the same response in Y direction. So it doesn't matter if you just make a tensile load in one direction or the other direction. Okay, now it's the time, since we have understood the mechanism of creep equation in SOLIDWORKS, to look at, a, a, let's say, a sample data. Well, there is an address, as you can see here, and you can refer for so many materials, they have generated the creep, uh, let's say, test data. Well, what we are describing here, for a constant creep of 1%, they have measured the stress of the material and its variation at different temperature at 10,000 hours and 100 hours. So this is a typical, let's say, outcome of any creep testing machines. That is all published on this reference, and it might be a helpful reference for you if you are using a fairly similar grade of material as they have listed. What, what is very important? At a constant creep rate of 1%, after 10,000 hours and 100,000 uh, hours, the stress showing the reduction from 110 megapascal to 15 at different temperature applied. What you're supposed to do if you are receiving such a this, uh, let's say, uh, testing data is first have your formulation ready. Now, if you like to make the calculation temperature independent, means we are ignoring the variation over the time, means the horizontal variation, we're just going over to vertical variation. Simply means RCT is zero because there is no temperature dependency. Therefore, our equation is just considering C0, C1, and C2. And the next step, since we have just two test data at 10,000 hour and 100,000 hour, therefore we can just calculate two unknowns. For that reason, which is a valid reason, uh, we have assumed that C2 equals to 1, and our equation is going to modify it to epsilon equals to C0 times stress in a power of C1. So we have two unknowns as C0 and C1, and it's the right time to make the calculation. First, our strain rate is 0.01. C0 is what we don't know. For the sample of 110 megapascal, we have 10,000 hours. That is the first thing. And second, we go to the next one. Same strain rate. And then 
we have C0, 90 megapascal, and 100,000 hours. So we have two equations with two unknowns. As an outcome, we can see C0 is equal to that number, C1 is 11.47, and from the beginning, we have assumed that C2 equal to 1, and no dependency on the temperature. Since you got these constants, now it's the time to go back, create your case, and do the simulation on a uh, actual model, including the creep data. What I would like to do next is I'm going to test if the generated data and the, uh, let's say, equation of use is the correct one. Let's have a very simple example and looking at the bar, a rectangular bar with a dimension of 50 by 50 by 200 millimeter, which is undergone uh, a normal stress of 100 megapascal, and if I go back, you can see 100 megapascal is my first data at 10,000 hour and temperature of 550. So, I will put the stress or normal stress or a pressure of 10,000 megapascal on one side, and in order uh, for, for 10,000 hours, and in order to make, uh, let's say, a more, uh, let's say, effective simulation, I've used symmetry boundary condition. Well, that is the main bar, but I've just made three symmetrical plans, back, left, and bottom. So I've reduced my model, uh, let's say, size to be 25 by 25 by 100, because I have just considered a quarter of it. This bar has three symmetrical planes, and there is a stress of 110 megapascal running for 10,000 hour. Okay? What is supposed to do in this regard? First, in order to do any calculation on a CRIP, you need a nonlinear static or dynamic analysis. What we are going to learn in this case study, we are going to through the definition of material property and how we enter in the CRIP data. We're applying the boundary conditions. We're looking at study properties and pseudo time and calculation time of setting. And also at the end, what we are trying to achieve is that we're looking at the creep strain. Based on the formulation we got, creep strain on a single bar should show us 1%. And we are going to test if we are simply entering those constant SOLIDWORKS simulation can generate the same thing. And again, I'm emphasizing on one very important fact. The model, since you have a calibrated material, could be a different shape. And the reason that I have chosen the, let's say, uh, standard rectangular bar is how they, this material is getting tested. We would like to see if the simulation can produce the correct strain rate then if it is correct, we are confident with the material we have created here, then you can have your design with a different shape, well, the stiffness are different, and based on the, uh, let's say, uh, data you have provided, you can look at maybe different creep rates and creep, uh, let's say, elastic and plastic uh, values. All right, let's look at the case study. And let me bring it to screen. Okay, here is my rectangular bar. And the first thing as I can introduce, here it is. That is the dimensions. And what I have to do, as you know, SOLIDWORKS simulation is an add-in. Well, you can definitely go to your add-in list and simply activate any module, include SOLIDWORKS simulation then you will get the option to create a new study and make sure this time you're creating nonlinear static study for that testing. Clicking OK and you will have that one. The first very important step is to make sure we are getting the correct information entered into the software. As you know, the material uh, let's say properties is the first step anytime you're creating an analysis. Right click on the part list, apply edit material. 
okay either you selecting from the actual database or you have a custom material to apply so any of this is possible now from here if you have a linear elastic isotropic material if you or if you're going for plasticity then you have to tick on the creep effect and when you do that you will have something to mention here creep constant 1 2 and 3 accordingly c0 c1 and c2 and creep temperature dependency which is ct value well you can obviously see that is all being entered here one by one this is what we have calculated and these two are what we have assumed just by saying apply you done the first step look at uh, looking at my uh, let's say basis study you can see same material has been applied here these are the base information elastic modulus Poisson ratio and mass densities and also including creep effect and these are my values okay so as you can see you need a creep test data means like the other material property what is the elastic modulus what is the Poisson ratio what is the mass density what is the strain time dependent graph look like then you can translate that one using the equation to get this constant and if your constant and test data is correct the basis of your calculation is also correct all right now the next stages is look like uh, a normal setup for uh, let's say uh, any other simulation first of all you can see I have made a symmetry on phase one left phase two bottom and phase three on back I have a full symmetry model and then I've applied the pressure or applied the stress normal stress of 110 megapascal to that one looking at the curve that is how it's been applied okay it is all been set up except one step which is the study properties and how long does it take what sort of time step we are recording the result if we go to study properties you can see first of all start time is zero end time is 10,000 hour which is expressed in second as you can see here initial time increment of 180 seconds and it could go up to what you can see here 180,000 seconds it is more than important to be very careful with those steps always you can have uh, let's say um, big values and quickly run but if your study is failing you need to modify these two like the other studies you are performing if the load is huge and the software cannot converge it's coming with the failure of the analysis and what is required from you is to make sure you have slowly applied the load and make sure it is not applying more and more even if it's converging make sure the number of adjustments is getting more than five if it's required and then looking at the solution so what would be happen is when we clicking run on this one that pressure is going to apply for that time frame well slowly applying with what we have set up here as initial increments and maximum let's say uh, amount of load and it's showing us what is happening at the end all right running this study and I've got the result ready for you now it's the time to see if the formulation which is producing 1% of creep strain is a valid equation and my data is valid and my study is calibrated first of all looking at the stress yes 110 megapascal all the way through now in order to look at the uh, let's say creep values you need to create a strain plot and in this uh, let's say um, 
plot, you can see normal strain, shear, equivalent strain, and normal strain in first principle and up to th third principle. If you look at your stress plots, you can look at different one as principal, normal, and shear. And if you look at the displacements, we can look at the x, y, z, and let's say resultant and reaction forces. However, if we look at the other options of the results here, you can see new things happening. Okay, one of the new things are creep strain. And if I modify that one, you can see it's a type of strain plot and it is normal strain. If we look at looking at that one, what we obviously can see here is that the amount of, uh, let's say, creep at the time 10,000 hour is showing us 0.01 or 1% means after 10,000 hours of load application we have produced 0.01% of strain that is exactly what the analytical let's say, solution is predicting therefore when you are looking at the strain values then simply you have to mention about the time and what is the value of a strain at the specific time. Looking at that one, you can see the plastic and elastic could be divided by end of the time frame as you can see here. It is 1497420. This is the time and this is the elastic strain value. And here is the creep strain at the end of the time well 10,000 hour is completed. What we can observe here is basically what we have generated at the strain values is 1% after 10,000 hours means the actual test data we had was okay and it's all valid here. So let me get back and we're looking at our test data again. So we were predicting that after 10,000 hours with the applied stress values of 110 regardless of the temperature we are producing 1% of strain and this is exactly what the simulation can show us. Alright, make sure we have created the correct study, here it is, and we're looking at the elastic strain or a plastic or total strain at the end of 10,000, 1% or 0 0.01 here. Now, this is the first approach and first data set, calculation of the constants and calibrating. Right now, if you are happy with what you have, now you can have different shape. Exactly same material can be used in any other design with this time frame or with the other time frames you can set up. Then you can look at the strain value at the end of the cycle. Means if I change the model, apply the same load or different loading, since the material is calibrated different time frame, I can be confident about the creep strain at the end. If it's predicting 0.5% or 5% or 2%, then I can rely on. Right now, I have fully calibrated material. All right. Now, let's go to the second example and the second case study when we are talking about time dependency here. All right. Uh, similar test, test data, well, we have the creep of uh, creep strain rate of 1% after 10,000 hour and 100,000 hour, and you can see the stress variation and temperature variation. This time, I would like to say my material is temperature dependent because I'm designing an object which is fully 
uh, under uh, temperature loads. It's not just the mechanical or structural load, there is a temperature load and that's why CT is coming to the resolution of the, uh, let's say, formulation. Now, again, we are repeating the same procedure since we have the test data and we simply looking at 1% or 0.01 and the strain rate. We got C0, C1, C2 and CD and here is 166, 155, 145 and 130 as we go horizontally and corresponding the temperatures. 450, 460, 470, and 480. We have four set of equations, and also you have a, a lot of resource to uh, let's say solve this equation as a World Farm Alpha uh, website. You definitely can put the equation in this form, and they easily can uh, let's say get you all this constant calculated and get back to you. Well, you can see now my constant I have new values. And now it is the time to verify if somebody who take care of this test data provided the correct information for us. How we can do? What we are selecting is 166 megapascal, applying on 100,000 hour, and then simply at the temperature of 450. If we are applying the same condition to a raw model, to an spiceman and it produced one percent of strain means the test data is correct then again the material is calibrated we can have variation of the design let me get back to the second study and looking at the case all right same one as you can see I have created everything the same, but this time if I go to my material, you can see I have temperature dependency value and new values for C0, C1, and C2. Okay, also as you can see, I have the same definition for symmetry and I have pressure of 166 megapascal on one end and more importantly I do have temperature applied to whole component simply you can go and select the component here to be 450 Celsius you can make this uh, let's say uh, temperature variation with the time if you like if you don't you simply ignore it all right now about the pseudo time here, if we get back to study properties, you can see it is running for 100,000 hour and simply it is running with the higher steps, lower number of adjustment to the model. Then after running this application first, we confirming yes, we get 166 megapascal of stress here and looking at the creep strain we are seeing a very important note here strain rate is not point uh, it's not one percent it is 0.5 percent or 0.005 that simply triggers one very important fact the test data we have from the beginning was not a good test data it has some problem with it as this simple example is not producing the same strain rate. Therefore, we have to go back and simply test the data again and make sure the import the test or raw data is correct. Alrighty guys, so what I would like to conclude here is that in order to perform any creep analysis in SolidWorks, you need a nonlinear study you need a material which the spiceman, which mostly look like a rectangular bar, is getting tested. And strain time graph or data has been generated. With the limitation, as we said, about, uh, let's say, isotropic material, incompressible material, and stuff like that, if your test data is correct, you have a power low, uh, let's say, equation, 
and you will calculate some constants of the, those equations. This would be the input to your material section in SOLIDWORKS simulation. If those constants are not correct, your end result, like what we have, in, uh, let's say, introduced here, is not correct as well. But if it's generating the correct thing, now you are happy and you are ready to go to have different design, different shape, using the same material, now apply different temperature, now apply different uh, stress values or force, and looking at a different time frame after 10,000 hour, 100,000 hour, or anything else, and looking at your strain values at the end of the cycle. All right? Then simply you are producing different results here. All right? So this is almost concluding what we have and the last thing I would like to cover here is about what you have as a solution in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Well, first of all, you know that SOLIDWORKS simulation package could be started from SOLIDWORKS uh, simulation standard where you are able to do any linear static on the assemblies, do the fatigue test, trend tracker and time-based motion. Uh, staying with the, uh, let's say, limitation of linear static studies, you can uh, perform more studies uh, uh, using SOLIDWORKS simulation professionals such as frequency, thermal, drop test, buckling, and etc. as you can see on the second section. Now for today's topic, as we said, you require to do nonlinear dynamic or static in order to do the creep. This is part of SOLIDWORKS simulation premium and you simply can have this license to perform all the tasks including creep as you can see in this section linear and nonlinear dynamic nonlinear uh, static studies and doing on composites alrighty guys I would like to thank everybody for your uh, listening and attendance I hope this session was uh, informative for you Please, if you have more, uh, let's say, commercial discussion, you can always get back to John Belsham, Simulation Product Manager, and he will definitely be more than happy to uh, have a further discussion about the different package pricing. Uh, but if you have more technical, uh, let's say, information required and a bit of uh, more go into detail about your current project, always get back to me, Svandi Kuhi, and I'm Product Performance Consulting Manager at Intercat. Thank you everybody for attendance and hope to see you in uh, our next webinars.